shape so I can paint over later in the process. And here are this character, which is here. So same here, it's just a DAZ 3D model that I posed. And once I posed it, I, I re-sculpted a lot of on top of it to really make it work for me because DAZ 3D is really, honestly, an, an amazing tool. It's, it's really fantastic, but the meshes I use, I use mostly the Genesis meshes because I have a library of, of things and, and deformers for it. So I really like this mesh, though it starts to be a bit old. But I don't know if this cell solves that in, in the more recent version of Genesis. But this first version, Genesis, it has a lot of, of uh, anatomy issues. And it has a very strong print. Uh, I mean, I can generally tell if someone used a Genesis mesh and didn't took the time to, to re-sculpt on top of it. Because it has like very specific uh, anatomy anatomical imperfection and marks and it really shows especially in the feet and in the hands so generally i i try to to sculpt the curls i try to sculpt every part of the mesh that is visible first because like for example here i didn't resculpt the head because it wasn't visible that much but apart from that i i resculpted the, the breast i resculpted the hand because especially the hands, I really wanted to have express, more expressive hands, so I did resculpt them to have, to have more interesting, uh, yeah, fingers and and anatomy. And every time that I'm doing something, I'm I, I really try to as much as I can, as often as I can, send my update in Keyshot. I I try to never use what I see in a ZBrush to decide whether it's good or not. Obviously, I have to see what I'm doing. So I'm looking at it the moment I'm I'm resculpting a bit the end, for example, I'm going to look at, at what I'm doing. But what is important is the result in my Canva. And it's not the result in, um, in, in ZBrush. And when I talk about cheating in 3D, I do it a lot. So for example, here I had I had an issue with with the fit. So I'm going to show you the different stages here. So it was my, my first rough sketch to decide my composition. Then I, I started to refine the composition a bit and try to organize my main vortex with with the uh, balloons. I, I already had in mind when I was doing that that I would add all these clouds to help link each of these elements together. Then I started to add Alice. And, and when I was adding, adding this main character, I had like a specific problem with the camera lens. And here I'm using a very wide lens. Let me show you. It's a, it's a 25 millimeters. And it starts to be quite a wide lens. And the issue with wide lens in 3D happen especially with characters because as much as environment is concerned i think environments and architectures architecture react very well to wide lens it, it create it can create very interesting patterns and and yes abstract patterns but for characters it starts to create like super weird deformations that doesn't work at all and is this was happening with the fit so the, the fit here was very generic, you know, very does like fit. So I started to resculpt the pose and start to find something more interesting to, to express the fall. And now I fixed it. The issue I had, especially with the right foot was a size issue. The right foot, it was looking absolutely huge. And this is because of the of the lens. So what I did, uh, I totally cheated with the fit. As you can see now, I, I reducted the, the size of the fit a lot. It doesn't make sense to have such a small fit in reality. And the left fit, the right fit, sorry, is 
much smaller than the left feet because even though I had reduced the size of both feet, the left one, which is closer to the camera, was still looking way too big. So I had to size it down to make it work. So cheating with 3D to have something that works in 2D is very, very important. And something also different happen with wide lens. And this is why I try to think about this as my painting right from the beginning. And I try to decide of what I'm doing in 3D based on this projection. And the specific thing that happened with a wide lens is a deformation that tends to, to, compress, to compress things increasingly as you go towards the center of the image. And this is why it's for me, when I try to do photography with wide lens, I have, I have issues because nature isn't necessarily organized in a way that allows to find really nice composition. So I'm always in admiration for photographers that manage to do really, really good composition with wide lens because I think it's something actually really difficult uh, for me. It's difficult for me to find a spot in nature which has the correct balance of elements that are going to work properly with a wide lens. Most of the time it starts to blow the details in the border of the image and it starts to have like a too high density of details in the center of the image. But in, in 3D, when we are making images, we, we can specifically choose to organize our elements so they are going to counterbalance this wide lens effect. So see, this is what I did in this image. Because I was organizing my elements right into ZBrush and always fully aware of the 3D projection, I could really decide to, you know, move the shapes around to really focus on the 2D projection. So on the abstract shapes, this is, this is a shape, this is a shape, this is a shape. And I didn't want it. I didn't want to have this specific, very dense organization of shape in the center of the image while I have only big white shapes at the outside. I hope this makes sense. Um, cheating with 3D, again, very important. Like for example, for this main character that is falling down and you know, all this part of the scene here, mainly, mainly, I mean, all this part here, it doesn't make sense in 3D based on what I'm trying to explain. The, the story I'm telling here is about this part of the scene, this character and these balloons, they are falling straight toward the center of the hole. But as you can see, this is not what is happening in 3D. In 3D, they are falling uh, nowhere, basically. They are falling not even in this character, you know, yeah, the main character is here, you can see. It's very small, so we don't necessarily see it, but let me use another shader. So basically, this character is falling nowhere. And only the, the rabbit is actually falling into the hole. And the thing is, I had to cheat with that because it wasn't possible with my current camera to have all of these elements working the way I wanted them to work. So I, I just had to cheat. I, I, well, this is what I wanted to, to say. 3D is not meant to be true or to be false. It's just a tool to paint. It's just a tool to create images in this process. It's just a painting process. So what matters is the final composition. It's not, it's not whether it's possible or not possible. So I'm just going to move this scene around to show you the shadow casting 
because it's very important. So let's take this piece of geometry here. And I'm going to get back to my main camera, shot cam, and remove it. And a small part, a small part of it was in order to create this bottom dark patterns. But I also wanted to be able to correct specifically as much as I can. I think it was a 21, I believe. Yeah. So once again here, I had, I had this idea to create this vortex kind of elements. So this is why I wanted to have as much as, as possible lines that were flowing in that direction. So it could be extremely easy to fix in 2D, but if it's if it doesn't take time for me to fix it in 3D, I'm fixing it in 3D. So I just move around my shadow caster behind it in order to have this uh, specific uh, pattern in here. So I think here, same thing. No, it doesn't cast anything, so I think it's fine. So if I'm moving in performance mode, so I can tumble around more easily. Yeah, we can see that this scene mostly doesn't make sense as soon as I'm looking at it from another angle. And honestly, apart, apart from really some specific moment where I needed to select an object which was outside of, uh, of the camera, as I did now, to select that one, for example, uh, I mostly never moved away from this main camera angle. I saved a couple other camera angles, so what is this one? This one is maybe a slight change. Let me see. No, it's 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 the exact same camera. So most of the time I, I was only in this camera angle trying to really fix things, move things around and having them to to work and you know try the little very little uh, composition problems. So what I call a composition problem is, for example, how do I organize these elements so they are not boring? So there is like just the proper balance of distance between two elements. So they are not equal, but they are not too close one to another. So we lose this idea of chaining of elements. And even right now, in this, in this mode, what I'm trying to see is really the structure of the composition. So even though there is no uh, self-shadow that allows to see the patterns of, uh, of dark values and bright value, I, I, sometimes I'm just moving in this mode to really focus on edges. Going back into basic mode just to have the, the patterns. So it's really a matter of, for example, as I said before, how to organize things with interest. So this one is in the light, and this one moves into shadows. So this helps to create uh, patterns of values that break. Uh, the uh, uniformity of of the of this spiral because there is a danger that this spiral becomes too obvious is all if all of the elements are more or less organized in a in a too regular way so now by playing with local colors and having this one to detach from the background thanks to a brighter local colors it's possible to have a more interesting organization of values to uh, to make this spiral work in a in a more 
dynamic way. Rendering. So none, I think none of the um, process I'm following in either in 3D, either in ZBrush or in Keyshot is really specific to Keyshot and ZBrush. You, you can replicate this in any 3D package uh, you like to use. So once I have, once I have, sorry, once I have my, um, my composition done, I mean, this is my final uh, pass. So right now I have just the proper amount of details I want. And I know that most of the other details I'm going to fix this into, into Photoshop and, and also simplify some part of the image. Then I'm doing my rendering. So, um, I've been rendering this at six, 6K wide, even though I did the image at 8K. Well, not wide at all, 8K tall. So this was rendered at, at 6K and, and I, I've been working at 8K in Photoshop. But uh, <clears throat> this is perfectly enough. Uh, for the need I have. So generally what I do is I'm rendering, um, I'm looking at my passes. I'm rendering generally one diffuse pass. So I just want to have the, the perfectly matte material informations. Basically, where where is the light and where is the shadow? So this is one pass. <clears throat> then I like to do this this no shelf self shadow pass. So basically, this is a, this is a pass with this is the simplest type of rendering you can do, where there is no cast shadow whatsoever. And this is an interesting pass because it it helped me ger generally to redefine this the local shading of the elements, because sometimes with this kind of pass, which have some really nice. Uh, boon light and some very very interesting uh, very nice lighting quality where there is like this very nice boon light from one object to another and it's really interesting but it tends to to obfuscate some of the local shading which can be useful to separate one element to another like for example here there is like this quite nice boon light on the shoulder from this character behind. But in some situation, it can become uh, a bit of an issue because we are lack lacking the, the uh, local shading information that helps to, uh, to exaggerate how the form is turning. And sometimes it's useful at the composition level. So this is why I'm doing this pass and it, it doesn't take very long to, to render. Uh, this pass is something that you can do natively in KitShot, but I think you can do it in, in any software and it's a normal orientation pass. So it's, it's simply, it's simply, I think, basically, uh, a normal map for, an, it's, it's a pass with a normal map applied directly on the material. So it help you, <clears throat> it can help to select top facing plane or just you know make some finer finer selection and sometimes it's it's interesting to just quickly bring uh, some color variation uh, another very important pass obviously it's a depth pass so i'm doing the de depth pass rendering it's not it's not me it's uh, once again key shot with us which does this but it's run it's rendered at uh, 32 bits so it's important to render at 32 bits to be able to select all these finest details that we can see right now. If the map were done in 8 bits, it wouldn't be possible to get any of the details which are in here. But thanks to the 32 bits, all the information of depth they are present even in the blackest black and the whitest white. It's possible to retrieve all the information. So I'm doing an ID pass. 
So in Keyshot, it's called a clone pass, but you can do an ID pass in your favorite package very easily. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pass which is very useful for the entire 3D process. So normally, if you've been studying 3D, or if you don't know how to use it, you can look on the internet. If you're using Maya, Blender, whatever, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to do an ID pass. So an ID pass is extremely important because as I'm really working as much as I can to solve my composition uh, as much as I can in, in, in 3D, it means that my edges are mostly not going to change. Uh, and if I need to change some edges and you know change the size of some elements, I, I will mostly do it later in the rendering process. So I can rely on this path to quickly select any shape I want and start to build my rendering in Photoshop. So it's very, very, very important and very useful path. And, uh, and I'm doing like this very tight um, occlusion map, occlusion rendering. And uh, this occlusion path, I try to focus almost on, on a line type of rendering. So it generally, generally helped me to exaggerate some of the feature of the geometry, just to, to help like more draw some elements because sometimes once again with the uh, very nice boon slide, some elements start to disappear. And uh, I use this map to, to help me to exaggerate some of the local features. And these are two different types of uh, reflection, reflection map. So what I'm interested in these maps is just to get the information of reflection, obviously, that I'm going to use to, to build my materials. And I don't remember if I use this pass or not. It's very noisy, so maybe this is a pass I, I stopped after before it finished. I don't. I don't know. Then I did some some material specific passes for the skin. <clears throat> so I just did a quick uh, translucent material pass for both the um, the clothing and the, the skin. And I think. Uh, I don't know why I did both. Maybe there is a different, dif different setting. I don't remember, but it's just to to get a quick indication of uh, of translucency. And translucency, it's it's easy to build uh, by hand in um, in Photoshop, but it doesn't take that much time to to render, especially in Keyshot because Keyshot is damn fast. So why not doing it? And then once I did that, I'm doing all of my texture passes. So texture passes, and after that, I'm going to show you why I'm, why I'm doing this in Keyshot. But basically, these texture passes, they are just um, a box projection of any kind of texture on the geometry. So a box projection, if you don't know what it is, it's simply like you, you imagine uh, Keyshot is looking at the orientation of each face. And if the normal is pointing toward one of the face of the box, it's going to project the texture in that direction. So it's a very quick and a very fast way to projecting texture in, a, in an interesting way on the geometry. It, it wouldn't work for, for very accurate texture projection in a, in a 3D pipeline. But for illustration, it's it's perfect because it, it allows me to create these random maps, these random te texture maps. And after that, once again, I'm going to show you the texture I'm using. And uh, generally, I don't really know what I'm going to do with these textures, but I just I just like my mind, you know, the free association and so on. Okay, I'm dropping a texture, I'm, I'm messing around with parameters, and in, if I find it cool, and I'm just spotting maybe for some part of the image a pattern or a color variation that seems interesting, so, so I'm, I, I'm rendering it. 
you know, various textures. It's just to have like textures already there so I can mess around with them in Photoshop. So let me show you how I do that. So I love fractals and I love fractal softwares and uh, I, I love to render uh, sometimes uh, if I, I have a bit of spare time, I, I like to experiment with fractals and try to generate these nice textures. So these are a bunch of, uh, of textures I generated a while ago. And uh, I really love them because they, they really help me to create these random texture passes that I'm going to use later for, for compositing. Really, really nice texture. So I, I, I did experiment with a lot of different uh, fractal softwares. Most of them, they are uh, open source and free to use. And um, you can go on Google and check for 2D fractals and you, you'll see a, a really amazing number of, top to, of softwares you can try for yourself. They are really, very interesting. So the way I'm doing it in Keyshot, I'm selecting like my main material. You know, I, I only have one material because I'm, I'm doing render passes. It, it makes my life easier than having like various different materials. So I try to have like just one material and it allows me for a very straight and simple process. So if I want to do an ambient occlusion map, I can select from here my occlusion and just you know, play with the radius depending on the, on the type of a, of, of a render pass I want to create. And for this uh, texture passes, I just use a flat materials, which has no shading, and I'm dropping a texture just like that on here, selecting my color channel. And uh, you can see there is like these different types of projections. Sometimes I'm, I'm trying other projections. I'm not always using the box map because some, some other types of projections are really interesting to obtain uh, certain effects. And then you can, you can play with the position of the, of the mapping. No, change the angle, change the scale. And it will depend on your 3D package, but most 3D package, they offer a queuing, a render queue uh, system. So it's really, really interesting because sometimes it can take time. So I, as you can see, I, I did it with Control U. So there is a shortcut here. And when, I, when I'm pressing Control U, I'm, I'm adding this uh, rendering to the queue. So here I don't have the proper setting, but what I would do instead generally is go in basic mode, select just four samples, and uh, let's delete this job. And I can render it, you can see even at, at full resolution of my final image, which is 8K, you'll see that these four samples, they are going to render extremely, extremely fast. Because basically it's a, it's a simple projection of the texture onto the geometry. And um, this screen process, it allows, it allows me to prepare all my render passes at the end of my workday. And during the night, I, I can have the computer to work for me and, and it will be able to render a huge amount of these passes in the night. And, uh, you know, I can just program my diffuse, my my met, my uh, reflection pass. And if I have a couple of other, other rendering pass, I'm trying to plan them at that moment. 
and it's only showing this at 2k tall <laughs> so it's, it's going to t take overall one minute to render at 8k so at 6k it should be 40, 40 seconds, I don't know, maybe 60 seconds. Very fast. So this is how I'm doing all this, uh, all of these passes. Dropping a texture, try to think about the kind of, of materials I want to simulate with it. And Yes, it, it could be seen as a waste of time because it's rendering this texture all over the place, either whether I'm going to use it everywhere or not. But honestly, it doesn't matter because it's it's very fast. It's so render in JPEG, so it doesn't take that much space on my hard drive. And uh, it creates potential for creativity later in Photoshop, which, uh, which is very interesting. And for the other type of materials, it's it's really straightforward. I'm selecting a diffuse, removing any kind of um, of texture information, select a 50% gray, and in the lighting mode, I I really don't try to optimize my render at all. I'm selecting this full simulation mode. You know, maybe it's a waste of computing power because I don't need it, but honestly, as I can run it, run the rendering over the night, it doesn't take that much time. And, you know, depending of if I'm... <laughs> Most of the time for these diffuse passes, 64 samples it's is totally fine. Even 32 is fine. I mean... And for the reflection pass, I'm moving back into my basic mode because I don't need to have as much ray bounce. And I'm going to pick my metal material and uh, I'm going to choose a black as local color because I'm only looking to have the information about reflection. I generally never render this this type of pass right right there. Uh, I think most of the time they are pretty useless to have like this very accurate reflection and there is an issue of the materials that are that start to reflect themselves. So sometimes I, I have to um, take care about that. But I generally generally do two kind of render pass, like one with a point way, point one roughness, and some sometimes a point oh five. It depends of the level of granularity I want to have. And sometimes I go up to 0.25. It's really on a per scene basis. It depends on the type of material I have in my scene and the, the kind of, uh, of roughness I want to uh, simulate. Compositing. So now let's move into Photoshop and go through the files, the uh, 10 files I recorded one by one to see. So this was one stage, as you can see, it's it's pretty pretty weird. Okay, so at this stage, I didn't name my my folders properly, all of them. But here I have my lighting informations. So this is something I, I tend to do often because I, I really like this way of organizing my, uh, my rendering. And I put all of my lighting information into one folder and I put this folder in hard light mode. And what it does, and I'm going to show you this easily like that, I'm going to group this 
and put this into overlay mode. And let's call that one hard light. And put this one obviously into overlay. So overlay and hard light, they are they are the the uh, they have the opposite effect. So if you put one layer on top of another in hard light, or you put the bottom layer on top of the first one in overlay mode, it, it doesn't change anything. It's, it's, they, are, they are the opposite. And what I like about this process is I can use this layering in order to slowly build up my local colors from underneath my lighting information. And then later, I can continue to build up some more local colors on top of my lighting information. Because of the limitation of this hard light algorithm, there is only so far you can go with local colors and materials. So there is some type of materials that won't be possible to build with this workflow. But the main advantage is that it, it helps to preserve the initial lighting information and not destroy them too much. So it's, it's really great to uh, um, safely build local colors. So I generally drop my, my main diffuse path on top of everything. So I believe this one is the, uh, the render path where I only have local shading and not, and not uh, cast shadows just to help emphasize the local shading. It just had, it just had a bit more definition. Then I, I'm, I have dropped in here my normal orientation map with a bit of view saturation and an adjustment layer on top of everything because uh, when the local when the lighting information contains too much white, this is why I corrected it, it starts to blow the, the colors underneath and it's really not interesting. So I, I, start, I try to uh, be careful to have a limited range of values in my hard light layer uh, group of layers. And same here. So the beauty of the hard light and Basically, all of the um, layer mode that are in here, overlay, soft light, hard light, uh, vivid light, linear light, pin light, hard mix. I'm not sure for this pin light, hard mix, I never use them. And vivid light, I don't use it often. But I know for sure that linear light, hard light, soft light, overlay, they act in a way where they, they stay neutral if you have uh, 50% gray and underneath. And what I mean by that is, let me show you. If I pick a 50% gray and I'm inverting it, you know it. 50% gray is the uh, neutral point where it doesn't have any effect. Hard light. And this is great. Ah, uh, yeah, I thought this was strange. Okay. You can see it doesn't change anything. So let's make a big white in here. So it's the same for overlay. Soft light, hard light, vivid light, linear light, pin light. Yeah, so it works for this one, two, three, four, five, six. So I have this 50% gray, and then I'm starting to build my local colors from here. So what I really love about this process is now because this local colors layer, group of layers, it is underneath my, my shading information, my lighting information. Prefer use the word lighting than shading. 
Okay. Because it's underneath, I can use any combination. As you can see, if you look in here, it's, it's a normal layer. Here I have one and another one, which is in color, color mode. And this one is in soft light. And this one is in overlay. And this one in screen. And this one in soft light again. So it allows me to use all of the capacity of Photoshop to build an interesting local color layer underneath my lighting information. So then I start to add textures. So let's get back to the initial one to make sure I'm not screwing up anything. Texture on, on top of it. And now I'm starting to change the local colors with like a strongest statement. So this base underneath pass is just temporary, just to have something. So it's not like a white canvas. It's, it's, it's like an, an underneath texture, but slowly I'm going to tweak and remove a lot of this very strong information. Um, the thing, I, I like to think about the way <clears throat> I'm working is I'm trying in a way to art direct uh, happy accidents. So this is why I'm doing all of these render passes in uh, before knowing even if I'm going to need them because I want to create a potential for happy accident to happen. And then I'm going to drop these textures and try to mess with uh, layer modes and just create something unexpected and just look and try to decide if it looks right or not. So I want to close this one and open the next one. My stage two. So it was like one hour after. And I tend to have like very big, big files. This is a, a byproduct of my workflow where I have a lot, a lot of layers. And uh, you can see it's a 2.15 gigabits file. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit big. So this is why at some point generally I name my files with the activity I'm doing at the moment. So right now I'm, I'm in the compositing. And at that moment, the file started to become too huge, close to three gigs. So I flattened, I'm going to show you that later. I flattened a part of this, of the file to make sure I could simplify it. So here we are. So lots, a lot of improvements since the last one. Let me get back to the first one, so we can we can see the, uh, the improvement from one to another. I'm going to close Keyshot to free some of my memory. Okay. You can see, you can see. So I was already here at AK in size. So I, I imported all of my textures files I needed since the beginning. So I could later just upsize my file and work on it. So it's, it's a bit more clean now as far as the organization goes. So basically, I have my colors here. And right here, I have my underneath. Did I say colors? I have my lighting here. Underneath, I have my local colors. And here, I have my depth. 
to put it in blue. And here I have my mood. And I think I'm going to record this one so you can have it for later. So let's get back to where we were before. So there is already quite a significant change, but I don't necessarily go from uh, bottom to top, which means that sometimes I'm going to drop some atmospheric depth and this is going to impact um, on my local colors. So then I'm going to go down again and start to tweak my local colors or my lighting depends here I'm, I'm uh, yeah in the local colors layer to to still have at the top of the of the stack an interesting uh, color balance so depth depth atmospheric depth is is a bit uh, of a challenge because it's not only about being realistic with how atmospheric works, but I think it's a, it's also about stylizing uh, exposure and start to crush details in in uh, in shadows and in highlights to make the image to simplify the image and make it more interesting. So. Here I just dropped, you can see it's a perfectly normal layer and I use my my depth math map, my depth map here to decide where this layer was starting to interact because atmospheric perspective, what happened in atmospheric perspective? What happened is that light is moving through the atmosphere and the atmosphere, the way it behaves in in Earth, at least on Earth, it tends to scatter the higher end of the light spectrum. So, as you as you know, you know the light. The light is behave in in two different way. It's it's particles uh, which are traveling always at the same speed, but these particles, they have specific property that makes them behave as wavelengths. Uh, this is my, me drawing a really nice wave. And the spectrum of the light that we can see, what we can see and we call light, in fact, is just a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this spectrum is composed of a series of, a, of an, infinite, an infinite series of, of various wavelengths. And the longer wavelengths, they tend to be the warmer colors, and the shorter wavelengths, they tend to be the uh, colder wavelengths. So this is me explaining scientifically how light works. <laughs> Sorry guys, if you are science nerds, you, you already know that and you sh probably find that my explanation is a total failure, but it's important to understand that, at least for us artists, because once you start to really understand the nature of light, a lot of things start to become really easier to figure out by yourself because atmospheric perspective can behave in such a wide range of, of complex uh, manner depending on, you know, is there like a lot of moisture in atmosphere? Is there like particles if you are in a desert environment and there is a lot of particles that are small particles that are floating in the air? Is there like uh, pollution, all of these start to change the way atmosphere behaves. So understanding atmospheric perspective for me is two things. First, understand the, 
physics of light is very important to understand how the electromagnetic spectrum works and understand why do we have local colors and and basically what light is i think it it's especially for realistic rendering it's really important whether you, it's not because you are using 3d and like the 3d software is doing a lot of the work for you uh, 3d software it won't it won't render atmospheric depths soon enough i think it's going to do it but anyway you'll still have to art direct the software to make sure that the software is doing something that is meaningful at the composition level so you'll still have to understand why things behave in a certain way to be able to stylize them and this this wavelength right when they go through the la different layers of of a uh, basically the, the, the oxygen molecules that exist in the air, the high part of the spectrum is going to scatter in the, in the atmosphere. So it means that the atmosphere is going to be filled with, with a very, very cold light. And now, when, for example, this part, the, the light which bounces from, let's say, yeah, this character here, this part here is going to receive light from the sun. So it's going to receive mostly a warmer light because a lot of the cold part of the, of the lighting has been scattered in the atmosphere. So this is going to receive here, sorry, a warm light. Okay. But here in the shadows, as the contrary, we don't receive the direct light from the sun. This part of the geometry is going to receive the, the scattered cold light, which is part of the sky dome. And this is why here the lighting is going to be, appear to be colder. Now, when both these light rays are going to bounce on the surface, to go toward her direction and reach whatever her eyes or the lens of the camera, they are going to move through layers and layers and layers of colder light that already that is already scattered in the atmosphere. Okay. And what is going to happen is that these layers of cold light they are going to change the local colors we see from the object and slightly move it toward in an, um, a colder light temperature. And the other thing that happen is that most of the details that exist in the shadows, because their, their intensity is not strong enough to, um, to go through the effect of the light that already exists in the atmosphere, then we, we are slightly going to, to lose a lot of these details. So here I added, because it's, it's deeper in the, in the uh, downside of the geometry, I added a bit of this dark layer at the bottom, because it makes no sense to have like these bright values in here. So here I'm, I'm adding another layer on Lighten. And now I'm, I'm correcting my, my levels just to, to really add this feeling of overall light scattered everywhere with a simple level. And now with a color layer, I will start to slightly move, not slightly here, it's a bit strong, to really move the spectrum that is receding, the part of the geometry that is receding in space, I want to move the spectrum toward a colder light temperature. And here it's just a slight correction of hue where I slowly moving the color temperature a bit more toward a bluish hue. Whether here I, I'm a bit more toward a cyan, cyan hue. So, yeah. 
didn't change things too much. And on top of everything, I soon I, I, I try to get my my mood, my general mood. And the way I see rendering process, I really try to separate each and every um, part of the rendering on separate uh, layer. And the same way in movies, uh, color artists are color grading the final result to get an interesting uh, color palette for a specific scene. I try to keep my mood in a separate layer on top of everything. This way I don't have to to destroy any of the previous information I have. And it, it also gets easier to change, completely change the mood if I want at, at some point. And, you know, if I decide, I don't know, for some reason to do uh, a sunset or more of a sunset type of lighting, even though we are not uh, in a sunset situation. But, you know, I can just pick An adjustment layer and start to completely mess around again with my mood. Yeah, and which which slightly change the the color mood. It it could be definitely stronger if I if I'm more heavy and dead, you know. So create another type of uh, of color mood. At some point in this process, it starts to become essential to flatten the file because it it's really too huge and there is too much layer. It, it starts to become laggy in Photoshop because like at you know at eight thousand pixel tall. There is like not far from maybe a hundred layers, so it it starts to be really too too difficult to work with. And what I really love about this process is right now because it's all separated. At this stage, uh, <clears throat> I'll come back in details la later on what I do. But at this stage, I start to be happy with a part of the image, mostly the underneath part under the depth. So what I can do is just select anything underneath the depth layer and just flatten. And this is this is what I, I'm going to do in the in the next file. Flat, flatten everything underneath. And this is the second stage of, of my painting process. And the, in the last stage, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flatten everything. Everything apart from the mood. Because I, I always like to keep my mood separated and my paint over. And by doing this, I'll be able at this stage to start to move things around if if I decide that this rabbit is not big enough or it uh, I could tweak maybe its orientation a bit. It's the moment where I can simply copy past part of the image on itself and start to tweak things around and paint over it. At that moment, everything is going to be here, the color, the mood, uh, the composition is um, almost there, so it's not really difficult to just cut, copy and paste part of the image and make make bigger change in size or in positioning. But if I did my work at designing the composition properly, I shouldn't have to do that. Um, you can see since the last one, pretty pretty big improvement in this one. So this is the final one. Intermediate. You can see we are really, really close to final in here. So I'm going to maybe remove this one just so we can see these both. So here, what I did, I fixed, you can see at the composition level, I, I work on separating a little more my shapes. 
push things into shadow where I don't need to have details, you know, exaggerate, precise the composition, hide the clouds and so on. So let's get back to where we were before, depth and mood. So you can see even in this in these few uh, stages, I already tweaked my uh, atmospheric perspective to have something closer to what I wanted. Remove a bit of this yellowish uh, cast there were on local colors everywhere, and um, exaggerate a bit more the depth to separate this falling character from from the background and really help to make her feel isolated and alone in, the, in her fall. Uh, 